shout out to the 2017 folks and also a member of the HKS alumni board. So one of the unique things about the Kennedy School uh, is the combination of research and real world application. And that's true for a lot of crises and one of those is the climate crisis. Uh, it continues in connection with alumni. So I thought I'd just take a, a few minutes and mention to you all some ways in which alumni might engage together on the topic of the climate crisis. So just yesterday, some alumni met to share uh, their stories and concerns and get support and inspiration. So those kinds of organic meetings are wonderful. Uh, I also wanna let you know there is a climate group now on the Whova app. So you can uh, put your name there, put your email there if you wanna get um, follow-up information about the kinds of things that we're going to be mentioning just now. So following up on that kind of group support, that peer support that the amazing community at the Harvard Kennedy School can offer each other. Um, as my last project in my four-year board term, I'll be convening some peer groups of five or six people uh, working on climate uh, three times in June. So if you're interested in that, um, you can put your name and email in that Climate Whova group and I'll let you know more about that. Ongoing also, people may or may not know, that only one to two years old is the Harvard Alumni Climate and Environment SIG, which is an interest group for all of us who care about this topic. There are lots of activities and events there. There are monthly networking events. Uh, so highly encourage people to go to the Harvard Alumni uh, Association website, look under SIG, and among many other wonderful SIGs, you'll find the Harvard Alumni for Climate and the Environment. So we can continue to work together, communicate, collaborate, connect, and support each other. Today, and specifically uh, in relation to reunion, uh, the second tab, if you go to the reunion webpage, is called Offset Your Reunion Travel. And just hot off the presses, the school's Sustainability Leadership Council vetted a variety of offset programs and identified three platforms uh, to provide a way to calculate your greenhouse gas emissions impact from any travel for those who have traveled in, um, and you can purchase carbon offsets through those. So of course, the first line of defense is to reduce emissions, and when that's not possible, offsets is one possibility, assuming they meet a whole variety of criteria. I do want to note Harvard University does not endorse any provider, specifically, uh, of carbon offsets or other vendor. So, uh, so if you want a summary of these things and some other things, um, you're welcome to go on the Whova uh, reunion app, go under the community tab, and go to the climate group, and put your name and email there, and I'll follow up, or my email's there if you want to reach out to me directly. Um, and if you're having trouble with the Whova app, just go to the HKS Alumni Board page and you'll find my name down there under the S's all the way at the bottom, Brooke Souter. So, um, so today, this amazing panel we have on climate change and geopolitics. Uh, so our fellow reunion alumnus, uh, Jorge Gastelamende, MPA of 2007, will be moderating the panel. And uh, for those who weren't in the 2007 class and may not know, he is a recognized climate uh, and environmental policy and finance leader, lawyer, and passionate public spirited professional. Jorge is currently the director of global policy at the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council. Earlier in the year, he completed a part-time secondment as the Race to Resilience co-lead for the COP26 high-level climate champions. And prior to that, he spent 11 years at the Nature Conservancy, most recently as the Director of Global Water and Energy Policy. So you may have noticed on uh, the events page that we originally had three panelists who were going to join Jorge, and unfortunately, Joe Aldi will be unable to join us. But we are very privileged, of course, to have Hatlachrund Logadotir from the MP MC MPA 2017 class, again, classmate, and Robert Stevens as uh, panelists. 
So um, Hatla is now the Director General of Iceland's National Energy Authority and teaches the Arctic course at HKS. Previously, she co-founded and co-directed the Arctic Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School, where she now serves as a senior fellow. So many of us in 2017 and after probably remember her pulling that together and running around getting it. It was really quite amazing to see. Um, Hala is the founder of the Arctic Innovation Lab, a platform established to encourage solution-based dialogue on climate challenges. And she has also, as we know, collaborated with entrepreneurs, politicians, policy leaders across the region to drive change. Prior to HKS, she was the director of the Iceland School of Energy at Reykjavik University, where she lectured on energy policy. Now, Robert Stevens is someone probably many of us have had the pleasure of being in class with. He's the A.J. Meyer Professor of Energy and Economic Development at HKS and the director of the Harvard Environmental Economics Program. I sat in on many of those seminars. I hope a lot of you did. And the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. So he's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a university fellow of resources for the future, former chair, of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Environmental Economics Advisory Board and a member of the Editorial Councils of Scholarly Periodicals. And Rob's research in conclusion has examined diverse areas of environmental economics and policy and has appeared in a variety of economics, law, and policy journals as well as several books. And he has been a consultant to government agencies, international organizations, corporations and advocacy groups, basically everybody. So, um, Jorge, I'll now turn it over to you. We look forward to this amazing panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke, for that uh, great introduction. Uh, I'm, the way we're gonna be managing the panel is we're gonna pose a couple of questions to both Hala and Rob. And then afterwards, I will open up to the floor for all of you to uh, ask questions to the panelists. I just wanted to make one remark before we uh, land into questions. Uh, about 25 years ago, when the UN uh, Climate Convention was set out, the objective was to um, work as a world together to avoid the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a point in which it wasn't dangerous to human lives and the ecosystems that sustain them. Uh, during Glasgow, uh, last year at COP26, the head of a quite radical organization, the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, said that we failed on that objective, and that we already have crossed a threshold that is irreversible. So now we're set out with two objectives, uh, and I just want to put that as a context for this conversation today and also as a call for action for HKS. Mm -hmm. We have the objective of keep trying to reduce emissions to a point in which we avoid further dangerous concentrations uh, that impact human lives. But also, we need to start figuring out how we adapt as a world to the impacts of climate change across, a, across the board. So with that context, in which we have now two objectives, uh, and we need to figure out solutions for those both, uh, at a pace that it's unprecedented, uh, I'll open the, the panel. Uh, Rob, let's, uh, we'll start with uh, you. Uh, the question that I would like to pose is how do geopolitics stem from or relate to both the science and economics of climate change? Uh, well, Jorge, uh, it's an important uh, question which I will answer, but first I'm gonna make a promotional announcement. Uh, the promotional announcement is an invitation to all of you who are here, all alumni. Um, Joe Aldi, as you heard, couldn't be with us because he's come down with COVID, um, so he's at home. Uh, and he is now running uh, a new institution at Harvard, based at the Harvard Kennedy School, of summer internships in the climate arena. And if he were here, he would say the following. We are eager to have alumni serve as mentors for the Harvard students who receive, they're gonna compete and receive these internships. 
And if any of you are interested in serving as a mentor, which would include coming up you know, in, in the very near future, then what you should do is go to the faculty webpage of Joe Aldi, and there you will find his email address, and just send him an email and say you're interested in serving as a mentor and that you're an alum, of course, of the Harvard Kennedy School, and that you're interested in serving as a mentor in the summer internship program. So that's my promotional announcement, but now I will turn to your question, I promise you. Uh, so there, there are two ways, I think, in which there's a very direct relationship between the science, economics, the politics, and the geopolitics, for that matter, of climate change. Uh, one is spatial and one is temporal. Uh, the spatial one is that greenhouse gases mix in the atmosphere and therefore it doesn't make any difference in terms of total damages or even the location of damages, whether a ton of carbon dioxide comes from Boston or Beijing. It has the, the same effect. It doesn't mean the damages are the same everywhere on the globe. Of course they're not, but the damages are not a function of the location of emissions. And that means something quite important economically. It means that an individual jurisdiction taking action, whether it says small as Cambridge, Massachusetts, or as large as the European Union, that that jurisdiction will incur the costs of taking action, which are typically the costs of m moving from coal, petroleum, natural gas to renewables, possibly to nuclear power, costs of greater degrees of energy efficiency, changes in manufacturing, et cetera. They'll incur those costs, but the benefits of whatever they've undertaken are going to be spread out globally around the world. And if you think of the basic ge geographic arithmetic, that tells us that for any individual jurisdiction, the direct climate benefits it receives from its actions are going to be less than the cost that it incurs. And that's the definition virtually of a global commons problem. And it precipitates, of course, a free rider incentive, namely it's in the interest of each jurisdiction not to take sufficient action, but to benefit from the actions of others. And it's for that reason why the work of Jorge and many of you who work in the international dimensions of climate change, uh, not just the domestic policies of each, but in global cooperation is so essential because international cooperation, not fully global, but international cooperation is necessary to deal with this problem, which is not the case with many other environmental threats that can be dealt with country by country or even town by town. So that's the, the spatial connection between science, economics, and the policy and politics. The other, as I said, is temporal, and that is that greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere. In particular, carbon dioxide has a half-life in the atmosphere of over 100 years. And the degree of climate change at any point in time is not a function of the emissions at that point in time, but of the accumulated stock, right? So we've got this bathtub, water's coming out of the faucet and an extremely slow drain, and the level in the bathtub, i.e. the degree of concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is constantly increasing. And what that tells us then is that the damages are for the long term, starting now, but going way off into the future. You stop all concentrations tomorrow morning. As you know, climate change is baked into the atmosphere and through the oceans. It's going to occur, and therefore, the benefits of a climate policy that's put in place now are spread out over time. Many are off in the future. But the costs of putting in place a policy, those are incurred immediately by the current set of voters. And that asymmetry between upfront costs and delayed benefits is an incredible challenge in representative democracies because the incentive for elected politicians is of course to work on precisely the opposite situation where you can give out benefits now and place the costs on future generations. So for that reason is an extremely difficult problem. So we have these two factors. One is the spatial nature, the global commons problem. The other is the intertemporal asymmetry both from science to economics to politics and geopolitics, and both are the basis for why it's a difficult problem.
I, I promise that we'll move into how to overcome that exactly. in this conversation, which uh, will come later on. But before that, I wanted to ask Hala uh, a question moving into the mitigation space um, and the connections in geopolitics mm -hmm. and uh, energy. So what impact has the Russia-Ukraine war had on the European energy market? Uh, and how does this tie into your work in the Arctic, particularly with uh, Finland and Sweden uh, now considering the applying and joining NATO? Thank you so much. And um, I have to start by saying how wonderful it is to be with all of you. And so nice to see many of you that participated in the Arctic Initiative journey, Alice Rokov, classmates and everyone. So great to be here back here at the Kennedy School and have a chance to talk about these issues. Um, it's many uh, big questions here, but I think it's obvious if we uh, look to Europe that Russia has a giant energy grip uh, on the continent and it is a situation that is felt by everyone. It is felt by home, it is felt by businesses through the high energy prices and that is putting an enormous pressure on politicians, uh, both the war and, and the energy prices to really act now. And the challenge is that there are no easy solutions. Um, uh, Russia has been like a gas station providing uh, around 40% uh, of gas uh, to Europe and there are no quick fixes here, how we can overcome that change uh, quickly. So in the short term, because you ask about the European markets, in the short term what has been happening is that governments have been intervening the market. Uh, they've been pr putting price uh, caps, they've been uh, paying directly to consumers, they've been uh, thinking about tax uh, deductions and so forth. Different tools uh, to try to mitigate the impact on consumers and businesses. But I think you, you were speaking about the long term and the short term and I think you know, this is of course short term actions. I, I think that the big thing that we're all looking at is how we can make sure that Europe uses this crisis to accelerate to a greener future, that we don't bounce back to more fossil fuels, which is the risk uh, uh, to some extent now. And I guess the good news, uh, since we want to focus on good news uh, as well, uh, is that if you look at the updated plan from the commission that was just launched last week, uh, there is a strong focus on accelerating the deployment of renewables, uh, increasing efficiency of buildings and so forth to really put a pressure on the, the green energy transition. Uh, that's a plan. Uh, the details and, and the difficulties are in the implementation. There's a lot of cost involved and so forth, but at least that's the signal that Europe is sending. Uh, then you asked about uh, the impacts of, of, of this on, in the Arctic context. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, uh, the security crisis has pushed uh, Finland and Sweden to apply for NATO. Um, and uh, if you look at the top of the globe, uh, you can see that in addition to Finland and Sweden, uh, the other Arctic states uh, are the Nordics, uh, including Greenland. Then you have the US, then you have Canada. And then you have Russia. If you think about the top of the globe, Russia is almost half of the Arctic coastline, if you will. It's the largest Arctic player. And um, the Arctic Council that convenes these different countries, the governments, uh, has been put on stop uh, after the invasion. Um, uh, we don't know how the operations of the Arctic Council will be, how, how it will be resumed. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, what will be the impact of, of, of uh, Finland and Sweden join, joining NATO. Uh, what we do know is that it will change the dimension in a way that uh, Finland and uh, Russia will be the only Arctic state that is not a NATO member. And we've seen some signaling already from Russia. I mean, they just today uh, starting halting gas supplies to Finland, uh, but Finland's uh, gas from supply is only around five to 10% of their overall energy consumption. So there's a lot of unknowns uh, uh, in this regarding to, to the Arctic dialogue, uh, but I will say that it is extremely important talking about climate change. I mean, the, 
the Arctic is warming faster than any other place on the planet. And there's a lot of issues that require collaboration. And it is hard to imagine effective Arctic collaboration without Russia's engagement. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, we can move forward on, on different issues uh, in the near and the long term. Um, maybe I'll finish with one thing, um, which is that I think it's interesting in the context of, of energy markets in Europe to follow the Arctic dimension in the Russia-China relationships. Um, Russia and China started partnering uh, on energy projects uh, uh, quite some years ago. They have co-invested in a uh, LNG project in, in the Yamal Peninsula in Russia and are exporting a gas for a part of the year over the poles. Uh, and then we have a couple of other projects, the Siberian pipeline from 2019 mm -hmm. and more uh, projects in, on the horizon. So um, uh, natural gas from the Arctic, from Russia Arctic, is uh, playing a role here. And it's going to be interesting as, as China and Russia collaborate potentially more uh, since we're seeing uh, Europe's plans now to uh, reduce their dependency. It's an interesting dimension in the Arctic context to follow. Hala, thank you so much. Uh, and it's, it's, it's heartening to hear how Europe is doubling down on green energy. Uh, certainly, you know, the ramifications of this are, are, are uh, uh, magnified by, the, by, the, by the, the war right now. I was just talking with a, with a colleague the other day that Guyana is sitting on a bubble of natural gas and the pressure that is mounting on these countries that are sitting on natural gas and fossil fuels mm -hmm. to export, to open up the reservoirs. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Mm -hmm. So having leadership from the European Union on sending a signal to a world that it's time not to move back and slide back into fossil fuels but rather double down on green energy uh, and renewables, it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let me now ask a question, uh, uh, one question that is both for, is both for you, uh, that is focused on solutions. And I used, I took the liberty of using the app, the WOBA app, uh, to open up questions. So I received several questions that are open public, uh, and I tried to summarize them in, in um, uh, three mini questions. Uh, and so, and that are focused on solutions. Let's move into that. I would love to, to have a conversation about you know, what to do with, with what we have. Uh, so how do we overcome, one, climate change being seen as a political issue? How do we overcome the existence of climate deniers? And finally, how do we overcome short-term political gains versus long-term consequences? You, Kind of, Rob, you mentioned that a bit in terms of uh, a problem. Now, how do we do that? What What are the uh, 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 you know uh, actions that we could take in the work that we do, but also as HKS uh, for that? So I guess I, I would modify the premise of the question a bit, and rather than say how do we change it from being a political problem. I would say, how do we recognize that it's a political problem and take politics into account? Because this is the Kennedy School. It's not the economics department or the physics department. We don't ignore the political realities. We say we have to work with the political realities, and then what can we accomplish? And so in terms of those two issues that I mentioned, the spatial, spatial and the temporal, I already said that the way to deal with the spatial issue, that is the global commons nature of the problem, is with international cooperation. And there are specific elements of the Paris Agreement, for those of you who like uh, to get into the weeds a bit, Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement, there are devices there that can address that. But the other part, which you really highlighted just now, is this intertemporal problem, the fact that the you know, benefits are off now and into the future and the costs are up front. Well, one way to address that is to create a constituency of beneficiaries now. And there are two ways that that can happen, and to some degree in some jurisdictions has happened. One is to recognize that correlated with the emissions of carbon dioxide in countries that burn coal, which include obviously China and the United States, as well as other countries, 
that when carbon dioxide is emitted, other pollutants are also emitted, in particular small particles of less than two and a half microns across that go deep into the lungs, PM 2.5, which has huge mortality implications, deaths this year, deaths next year. And in fact, if you look at the analysis that was done by the Obama administration of their proposal for reducing uh, the use of coal in the U.S., which was called the Clean Power Plan, uh, which did not uh, go forward, eventually was invalidated by courts. Um, that proposal, their own calculation was that 6% of the benefits were in terms of climate change benefits to the U.S., this is of domestic benefits, and 94% were in reducing PM 2.5, 94%. So greater recognition of that, of th that in many cases climate policies have correlated impacts that have huge public health implications, that's one way to address it. The other way that addresses it, you could say financially, is that those policies which are carbon pricing in nature, which could either be a carbon tax or a cap and trade system where the allowances are sold and so revenue comes to government, an important question that everyone cares about is what are you gonna do with that revenue? Because we're talking about hundreds of millions, indeed billions of dollars of revenue from a meaningful uh, program. And now, for example, in the European Union, the EU ETS, the trading system, is moving more and more towards auctioning. Well, one of the things that can be done with that revenue is to rebate it to consumers now, to the current generation of voters. I would hope that it would be targeted to most vulnerable communities, those who are most seriously affected by climate change, but importantly, those who are most seriously affected by the energy transition to reduce climate change. In the U.S., that's going to be coal miners in Appalachia, for example, uh, our own little developing country we have within the U.S. Uh, so those are just two examples of ways in which policies can directly address the international commons problem as well as this intertemporal problem. Rob, thanks. Hala. Yes, so um, it's uh, maybe to kind of bounce off of, of this thinking of uh, keeping the politics, it, the politics in it. I think if we look at the European Union, for an example, which has had a kind of strong leadership uh, in this field, I think that has made it more difficult because you asked about uh, climate change being a political issue. It has made it more difficult for individual European states uh, to make climate change a political issue because you have this kind of vessel, this big vessel, the European Union, sailing in, in a uh, straight direction and they have all these programs for education, for businesses. So, so many people are participating and, and get information. So, making uh, climate change uh, a political issue that is not happening or that it doesn't exist mm -hmm. is hard on a state level you have already kind of the journey uh, taking place. And if you look at polls in Europe, you see that actually majority of people, it's over 90% believe that climate change is a, is a serious issue. Uh, you st if you look at the data closer, you can see that there's a variation. Uh, you know, countries that have had maybe stronger climate uh, policies, like Germany, have higher ratio of people that are uh, believe that the issue is, is, is serious, that the science is, is there, that we need to act now. Uh, countries lo like Poland have slightly lower uh, figures, uh, which is kind of in line with having less political leadership. So mm -hmm. um, I would say political leadership matters. And in the case of the Europe, as an example, having the strong guidelines from the European Union that kind of trickles down to all the different uh, member states uh, has been effective. Thank you so much for the answer, uh, for your answers. And now we have about 40 minutes to uh, open the floor for questions that will go to panelists. I would ask, uh, if possible, if you can stand up and go towards the mics uh, so you can pose your question, it could be heard better. The second thing that I would encourage everybody is that 
first of all, say your name and your school affiliation, but most importantly, uh, pose a brief question. We need to, we will love to end the questions with a question mark. Uh, you know, climate change is a very controversial issue across the board. So, you know, we are happy to have statements, but let's be brief and close with a question mark so we can answer it. Uh, and with that, we'll open the floor. Please, sir. Thank you. So I am actually a guest here. I'm not an alumnus. My mother, uh, Jen Trady, is an alumnus from the class of 2007. I'm a current student at Georgetown University. Um, I, so I have a question about um, the carbon tax, as uh, you mentioned before. Um, one of the common criticisms, uh, you know, I live in France, and one of the common criticisms there is that the, the carbon tax will increase prices on, on gas, on, um, you know, different resources. Uh, and it will impact those who live in rural areas, who need to drive into urban areas for employment, jobs. And, you know, as I said, that, that turns into a big political problem, a big political issue, where right-wing and left-wing populists would often, um, you know, call out the, the, the you know, elitism of the uh, policymakers. How would you address those, those, those criticisms or those issues uh, with, you know, the carbon tax or other um, policies that might increase uh, prices? Uh, and might disproportionately affect those in, in rural areas. So thanks. So you, you're absolutely right that there always is concern around carbon pricing of, you know, the, of the burden that it places on, on on consumers. There are basically two ways to address that with a carbon tax. Um, the first one is don't do a carbon tax. Uh, period. <laughs> so um, th this is what economists refer to as going to second best policies. And not, in other words. You know, if we're in the Kennedy School, we're not in the economics department. When we're here, the optimal policy takes into account political feasibility. It's not what's going to be most efficient in the absence of political constraints. And so, therefore, I can tell you we're doing work. Joe Aldi and I are uh, co-principal investigators on a new project funded by the Sloan Foundation in which we're going to be looking at lessons learned, political economy and otherwise, for the design of so-called second best, for alternative policies, bring to account economic thinking, but not necessarily the simplest kind of carbon pricing. That said, the other way that I'll mention is just to restate what I mentioned before, is that with a carbon pricing mechanism, a way, you can address these distributional impacts. You can target the revenue. That's one of the wonderful things about carbon pricing policy compared to others is that there's government revenue, which can be used for a variety of purposes. And one of them is to alleviate the burden. You could make people actually, you can target it so that they're better off with the carbon tax. Yeah. Would you like to address a question? I'm, I may just add to, I think we're seeing so much in action uh, today with almost all governments in, in the European Union kind of I I intervening the market that there are so many ways to actually address the issue. So we are uh, targeting funding or channeling uh, the, the policy so it actually uh, solves some of those issues. Uh, I will also say about uh, the development of, of, of that model is that, you know, it's, there's a gap between theory and implementation, and there's a learning process as well in implementation. And I think there's uh, been a lot of lessons that need to be better outlined, and, and maybe we have a chance, and hopefully we will have a chance after the crisis, I say after because I hope the crisis will be over soon. Um, uh, to actually think about uh, the lessons that we've learned through the interventions that we've now been doing to, to, in the market to support vulnerable co uh, communities uh, to address this. So there's an opportunity in that regard. Excellent. Thanks for the answers. Uh, let's take turns. So now, yes, sir. Good morning. Um, my name is Jim McShane, mid-career uh, MPA 1992. I've seen in... <laughs> I've seen in some uh, recent media reports a suggestion that nuclear energy is maybe making a comeback. So just hear your comments on wh where that's headed and the pros and cons of nuclear energy as a, as a, new, a new source of uh, energy. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start with this since it's very much related to the energy crisis in Europe and kind of what investments countries are making now for the future. 
And you can say that, of course, after Fukushima, there was um, policies developed, particularly in Germany, to go away from nuclear. Um, um, and we're kind of seeing a situation now where uh, Germany, Germany has been struggling with that decision. And a part of the crisis now has been uh, deciding whether or not to close the uh, few nu nuclear plants that are still open. Ironically, there were six open until this year, so it's been also a, a, a timing issue. Um, so um, you're, you're seeing, if you, if you look at uh, Germany's energy mix, that nuclear, if, if you go back 10 years ago, played a considerable uh, role. Um, then they've been going slowly, kind of decreasing nuclear. And what has been coming instead? It's been a bounce back to fossil fuels. Uh, even though renewables energy has have also been increasing. At the same time, if you look at the neighboring country, France, they have been investing in modernizing their uh, nuclear plants and kind of betting on that as a part of uh, uh, their renewable energy transition. So I think we have now uh, a lot of debates in Europe about what role uh, nuclear should or, or might play uh, in the in the future and uh, the plans of the European Union uh, so it's an interesting uh, point in time uh, to uh, discuss that um, um, of course if, if um, of course there's um, multiple dimensions and dilemmas if something happens but I think Europe has to recognize and focus on uh, baseload power nuclear is a base load power natural gas is a base load power mm. And it's not the same to uh, reduce uh, uh, coal and LNG and, and nuclear. You cannot replace that with more windmills or with more solar power. You need these steady sources. So it's a very interesting time to, to think about what the future of baseload resources like nuclear will be in the broader energy picture for Europe, but also for other places in the world. So I think it's a, it's a simpler situation in the United States where um, nuclear power is unlikely, very, very unlikely uh, in the foreseeable future for economic reasons to be part of the picture of an energy transition to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the energy sector. Now that's partly because of the NIMBY problem and political resistance, which itself drives up costs. But what we have observed over time, and I can go back now, I'll go back about 20 years in the economic uh, analysis, there was a time at which, the point at which uh, you would see the cost point at which a lot of renewables became economically feasible to feed into the grid was about the same point at which nuclear did. It was about $75 per ton of carbon content at the time. And what's happened since then is that the price of uh, renewables has systematically come down because of technological change. And the price of nuclear power has maintained where it was or has increased. And so those have now split apart. So for those economic reasons, I'm not taking a position on this one way or the other, but for the largely economic reasons, it, it's not gonna be part of the story in the US. We have one nuclear power plant um, under construction in the U.S. that I'm aware of, and that's actually located adjacent to an existing facility. It's part of the same, so it didn't face a, a NIMBY problem. Thank you. Please. Good morning. Uh, Andres Vinelli, um, 97 MPP and O2 uh, PhD. Um, I have a question of second best, right? Um, I, I came to specialize in financial market regulations with the late and great uh, Professor Bob Glauber, who we all mourn, uh, and uh, have been working quite a bit on the area of the intersection of financial markets and climate. And my question is, uh, within this admittedly second best uh, set of, of proposals and perhaps solutions uh, that involve corporate disclosures, uh, perhaps trying to internalize those externalities um, by corporations or even banks. Uh, my question is two, two part. Is first, uh, what do you make of this? Is this a useful way of action or is it just a waste of uh, life energy? Uh, and the second one, lots of uh, big promises 
have been made, especially last year, by governments, corporations, banks, you name them, uh, about reductions. Uh, how should we take these promises? Is this something that is bound to, to land somewhere, or it's just another version of greenwashing? Thank you. Thanks for the question. So my answer is that there is some of both. Um, I guess initially, uh, if I had a choice of whether to leave it up to the private sector to decide how much of any public good should be provided, as opposed to elected officials in a democracy through their government, I would choose the latter, pure and simple. Um, that maybe is why I'm a professor here as opposed to across the river, where I have many friends uh, at Harvard Business School. Um, Forrest Reinhardt, a professor at Harvard Business School and a co-author of mine, um, we wrote a paper uh, not terribly long ago in which we made precisely that argument. If you want to bring it forward to today, then I don't place a huge amount of stock in the pronouncements of 2050, net zero, whether those pronouncements come from a multinational corporation, or for that matter, if they come from government officials or universities, because it's 2050. I want to hear about 2030. That's if we're going to make pronouncements. And then even looking there, analysis has been done, as you probably know, there quite a few analyses out that have looked at these various statements from the private sector. And some of the co companies, I won't name names, but some of the companies, it's real. They are really doing it. In, in particular, some of the large oil companies because it's an existential issue for them to diversify quickly. Um, but in other cases, some of the pronouncements do look like uh, greenwashing. Yeah, I will add to that uh, in terms of kind of financing the commitments. If, if we put this in context with the commitments made at the last COP and how it's going to, to fundraise and make governments live up to their, those commitments, um, I had a, the opportunity to listen to Aroki Sharma, who led the negotiations last time, and he was speaking about the follow-up of the negotiations and the planning for the next COP. And he did speak about um, how difficult or more difficult it was now when we have higher capital, capital costs, we have, of course, the impact of the uh, war in Ukraine, we have the impact of COVID, you know, uh, economies are still struggling because of COVID, that it was harder to make governments uh, live up to those expectations. At the same time, it is so important, of course, to realize the investments now uh, uh, for the future. So it is a real challenge. Thank you. Let's move to the next question. Michaela. I'm a uh, 2000, um, 2007. And um, I have until recently been the German climate and energy ambassador. So I might actually wanted to ask another question, but if the public allows me to rectify a little bit what you said on the nuclear in Germany. The six companies, the companies who are closing down the um, nuclear power stations even don't want to reopen them because it takes more than a year to close down a nuclear power station. The people are already off who are working, they have new jobs, there's no fuel, it takes more than a year to get the fuel. So even if Germany wanted to turn around due to the nuclear, uh, to the war in Ukraine, we couldn't do this. On the other hand, let me stress that in France, where I'm living now, because I'm now the German ambassador to the OECD, um, is 50% of the nuclear power stations are at the moment not working because either stuff is corroding, not working, or climate change is hitting because cooling water is not there. Lots of them are in the Rhone Valley. You know that in summer, nearly 70% of the nuclear energy in, um, in France is not working and they were very much dependent on Germany's overproduction of electricity and they don't like that we are closing down our coal mines at lignite, uh, lignite um, fired power stations because they don't get cheap stuff from us anymore. Just to rectify a little bit what you said before. 
thank you. But my real question was for the panel, um, you have called this climate and geopolitics. I think we have an issue which is overlooked at the moment a bit. The one is climate and security. What does it mean for the security sector, uh, security of people, migration, and other things? But another issue which is very much on our headlines now, also with the war in Ukraine, is food. Is food production. We have to be aware that 50% um, of the food which is produced in the world is actually um, uh, produced um, um, for feed of um, animals which we eat afterwards. This has an impact and this is due to the cutting down of the Amazon forest and other in, uh, implications. So I think this issue um, is a very important one and we should really l look into this also from a geopolitical side of view. Thank you. Hey, Michaela, um, thanks for your statement. Your question? My question is just that I wanted to know to what extent we are still looking into the question of foodstuff, of all of this. Aren't we overlooking this at the moment? And also, aren't we a bit arrogant in our countries to think that we don't, that we are, have to mitigate and others in the third world, but we ourselves are not doing enough because we think it is in the third world that we have to help out whilst we our, ourselves are thinking we are doing fine. That's my question. Thanks for raising that issue. Mm -hmm. Pakistan. Thank, you, Thank you so much for your comments and your questions. And just to start off with, I know it's been a process of a long-term policy and that decisions m were not made this year. And I've read the reports about you know, the decisions that you described. So make it, uh, using it as an example of, of different policy options. Um, I do want to use the opportunity to congratulate Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Denmark and other countries that were just launching uh, this big wind uh, project in the North Sea. I think that's an example of a very um, important leadership that you're taking on offshore wind, so congratulations on that. I will say on the, on the food dimension that in the context of the Arctic, where, which is uh, uh, has uh, emer big uh, resources when it comes to fisheries, for an example, land and so forth. The transition has been back to we need to strengthen our agriculture. We need to strengthen how we utilize our resources. We're throwing still so much away from the fish we catch and so forth. Not so much in Iceland anymore, but uh, if we look at the Arctic as a whole. So going back uh, and, and thinking about holistic ways of uh, uh, utilizing better and producing more locally has been a big part of the Arctic dialogue on food security. And I think you're right. I think it needs to be a big part of the uh, dialogue as well as you're in Europe. Thank you. So um, you mentioned about our, aren't we being arrogant? Um, well, as a Harvard professor, I don't even know the meaning of the word arrogance. <laughs> so maybe afterwards you could explain to me. Um, but I, I think I want to put into context, it's, it's absolutely true, it's undeniable, the math tells us that in terms of accumulated emissions, in other words, the stock, that's what matters, not the emissions this year, but the stock. The United States is the largest uh, contributor. Also up there are the, is the European Union. That's by definition because we industrialization process for all these years. So that's true. But we can't just look backwards. If we want to address the problem, we have to look forwards. And the reality is that the growth in emissions, uh, you know, China overtook the United States in emissions in 2006. And the growth in emissions is not coming from the OECD countries which are not cutting enough, but are flat to declining in emissions, simply because energy comes at a cost, the growth in emissions are from the large, the bulk, from the large emerging economies, China, India, Brazil, Korea, South Africa, Mexico, and Indonesia. That's where, where the bulk is. Now you'll notice I mentioned these large emerging economies. I wasn't mentioning developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are mired in poverty and we ought to leave them alone. There's no reason to make them take on costs at this point for emissions reductions. Rather, the only way they should be involved, and really are going to be involved, in my view, under the Paris Agreement, is in terms of adaptation funds, which I see the purpose of the 
you know, the targeted $100 billion per year. And then what's also going to become increasingly important in Sharm el-Sheikh at the next annual conference of the parties, and that's this phrase, loss and damage. Mm -hmm. That even if, you know, you mitigate emissions, you still have climate change, that's the adaptation fund, but some things can't be adapted for, like small island nations going underwater. So that's where the loss and damage comes up. And it's been, you know, as I'm sure you well know, as a negotiator, it's been with us for quite a while in the annual negotiations, but it got a real boost this year on the final Saturday, and I think it's going to be one of the big issues on the table uh, in the talks this year. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we have plenty of people for questions. We have about 20 minutes. So I will encourage you, if possible, if you make a short question uh, so we can deal with as, much, as many as possible. Hopefully, we'll cover all the eight people that are waiting. Thank you. I'll try my best. Um, my name is Pietro Rabassi, MPA 2012, and I work uh, for Nordpool, which is, uh, well, uh, the world's uh, first uh, international uh, um, uh, power electricity market that was born in the Nordics, I'm afraid not in Iceland, but uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Now we operate in uh, Europe and, and worldwide. Uh, we talked about the European energy transition mm -hmm. and the fact that possibly there should be a further push uh, to invest in more uh, uh, renewable energy sources, uh, which is great, don't take me wrong, uh, but at the same time they, they come with, uh, with challenges. We know about Greek congestions, potential blackouts, price volatilities in the wholesale market. One day we have huge prices because there's no wind. On the other day, 250 euros megawatt hour. Then we have uh, negative prices the following day because it's a very windy day. So um, in this energy transition, gas had been thought to be the transition fuel. Now we have a problem because, uh, because of the, the war. Um, so my question is, um, do you think we still need uh, a base load uh, uh, fuel? And if so, what should it be? Should it be gas from other sources then? Should it be nuclear? Should it be coal, which is not good for a, from a CO2 perspective? What's your point of view? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, first of all, I know you've been kind of busy. It's interesting that you've been working for the North Pole. It's been, you know, a roller coaster following how the development this year. Um, I, so, uh, coming back to what we spoke about earlier, I think we have to keep in mind that the energy transition in Europe, as it is in, in most other places, it's an infrastructure transition, right? And I think we need to uh, make sure that it's not just about, again, uh, implementing more windmills or uh, more solar without thinking about the storage or the base load to control. And I think you're ex uh, right in the sense that, you know, if, we're, if it's not liquefied gas or if it's not natural gas, um, uh, then uh, we need something else. And it's hard to imagine, uh, again, thinking about the next few years, uh, what will, if it's, if it's not going to be natural gas, what else it will it be? Um, um, nuclear, it takes years to build uh, new production. If you're thinking about even uh, importing uh, gas from different parts of the world, you know, Germany is, is thinking about LNG terminals and so forth, but that's something that takes uh, a, a while to kind of kick off. So um, I think this is the toughest question for Europe. How are you going to deal with this energy storage? How are you going to deal with the baseload? And the sooner that we recognize and get people to understand that it is an, in, it is an infrastructure crisis, right? How we connect different markets, how we stabilize the grid, how we implement uh, storage, uh, the, the better we are going to be in, in solving the crisis. So um, uh, I guess the, the short an answer to your question is, Yes, we need to think about base load, and it's hard to imagine in the next few years how that is going to be without uh, the imports of gas. Thank you. Please. 
Thank you, Steve Epstein, MPP 1992. I'm actually a practicing emergency physician, so thank you for talking about public health. Um, but my question is really more about the negotiations, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that, because that's something that, you know, I remember taking James Sabinius's course in negotiating back in 92 when I was here. He had recently negotiated the law of the sea. This, as you've pointed out, has many more dimensions, and the temporal issue of this, I think, is, is really one of the more important. Um, because the paradigm for each of the um, actors changes over time. And we have whipsawing of all sorts of different elements, you know, within the negotiating party. So we just talked about nuclear energy in, in Germany and, and, and elsewhere. Um, we in the United States have had very different um, political figures with different views on climate change and what our role should be. How can you negotiate effectively under this paradigm? Um, is there a means to do so? And is it at the international level? Is it more having to work more at the local level within nations to solidify a paradigm that then can be brought to the international table? Um, and are governments actually the only correct um, players here? Uh, I'm thinking about the private sector and you know, multinational corporations. And maybe they are involved. I'm a novice in this area. But I'm wondering if you could get into a little bit more detail about how this negotiation actually works or doesn't work, and what you see as possible means to get it to work better. Thank you. So um, the Paris Climate Agreement, which is the current international law which exists in terms of fostering action globally and cooperation among countries, is, in my view, ideally suited to address the issue you raise of over time changes within countries politically, changes in countries in terms of uh, supply and demand within the, purely within the economies and therefore sectors rising, sectors falling. And that's because the structure of the Paris Agreement is not one in which the countries negotiated over their targets, which is the way it was done for the Kyoto Protocol. Um, rather, the Paris Agreement, the negotiations and what's in international law, the part that's binding under international law, is that each country, essentially every five years, has to say what it's going to do. Okay? Now, under the Kyoto Protocol, it was, it was therefore top-down. They negotiated these targets. What was the, that sounds great, because it's all binding under international law. Well, what happened when the targets became binding? Well, the United States never ratified the agreement. When it came time, push came to shove, Japan dropped out. Uh, Russia dropped out. Japan dropped out. Australia dropped out. What was left is the European Union and New Zealand in the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. 14% of global CO2 emissions associated with them. Under the Paris Agreement, with this different structure, which is a hybrid of top-down for centralized elements, but each country says what it's going to do, what it's politically feasible, with a certain aspiration over the next five to ten years, 97 percent of global emissions are associated with participating countries. And different countries take on different targets. Not surprisingly, among the most ambitious targets is, of course, the European Union which it also was previously, but the U.S. Now, what's also true, as you said, is there is this, this uh, whiplash that takes place. Whatever I meet at the negotiations each year with the negotiating teams from different countries, they want to meet with our, the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements because of our research, and they want to talk about it, da 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 But they always start out by recognizing that I'm from the United States, and so they therefore take five minutes to beat up on the U.S. Um, which I always enjoy. Uh, and they did that, by the way, during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration, and during the Biden administration. There's consistency there. But one of the things they do point out that makes it so difficult for them is the whiplash. You know, of we went from Bush, Obama, Trump, and here, you know, it's out and in, in and out, aggressive targets and non-aggressive targets. What's remarkable, and I'll finish with this, is that during the Trump years, when I would meet with these negotiating teams from around the world, they'd say, you're from the US, yes. I was ready to hear every, the complaints. And then they'd say, you know what's remarkable? You know, Mr. Trump denies climate change and he's initiated the process to pull the US out of the Paris Agreement. But your negotiating team from the US State Department is fully engaged 
and is being very constructive. Indeed, the U.S. and China were co-leading one important element of the negotiations during the Trump years. Now, the negative characterization of that, which you would have heard from, I guess, people on the right, is that's the deep state, right? The deep state. You know, when you're in the Kennedy School of Government, those are the people we're training. You know, that's a, you know, and we admire the French bureaucracy. We wish we had one like that. And there was continuity, quite remarkably. The U.S. at the level, not the political appointee level, but everything else in the State Department, that negotiating team, they continued to work constructively during the Trump years. Don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, I might just add to that kind of going from the global negotiation perspective to the local negotiation perspective, because a lot of the implementation needs to take place locally and there's a lot of negotiations that take place locally and since the, the national energy authority that i uh, work with uh, it's a permitting organization as well we issue permits and if you think about negotiation that need to take place on the through the permitting that's really difficult for the implementation because you have all the local different stakeholders that you know, need to agree on a new transmission line or need to agree on a new uh, wind farm. And that's also, when we think about these timelines, that's also a challenge to reach the goals. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting in the new uh, European uh, Commission plans that were issued last week uh, that they're uh, looking at how we can shorten the permitting process. And, and to be able to shorten them will require uh, a lot of local negotiations. And I think there's a lot of questions around, will that give us better results? You know, these processes are designed also to be complicated because we want the best outcome. So uh, that's an interesting kind of negotiation challenge on the, on the, in the implementation uh, level uh, locally. Thank you. We're heading into the last 10 minutes of the session, so uh, please. Well, thanks. I'll try to keep this short. My name is Dan Crisofulli. I'm a partner with a, a fund seeking positive environmental and social outcomes. But the biggest honor was uh, earlier this year being appointed by my mayor to our local environmental commission in my small city, a purely voluntary assignment. But it is opening my eyes to the gap between the top-down policies and commitments and the lack of action, tools, and plans at the local level. And that's in the US. I'm, I suspect in Europe it's, it's much farther ahead. But I'm looking for you know, advice, guidance on how to connect the two and activate more at the local level. Thank you. Well, I, I, I have a, a perhaps trivial answer, which is may not be what you had in mind. When people ask me, um, including students, current students, in particular. I was a student many years ago. No, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> including Harvard College students, you know, in their uh, late teens, early 20s. Um, what can they do about climate change? My answer is one word, vote. Uh, I think it's the most important thing that can be done uh, People, we have an embarrassingly, shockingly, for those of you who are not from the United States, maybe you don't know, that the rate of our electorate, the people qualified to vote, voting, is among the lowest among the advanced economies of the world. And then we have something even worse than that. We now have a primary system in the United States, which are binding primaries for each of the parties, and only the most passionate people for those parties go to vote. So of course we get the most conservative Republicans and the most liberal Democrats, and we have, that's one of the contributing factors to this terrible political polarization that we have in, in the US Congress. So my response really is anything you can do to increase voting, and if they're all Republicans, okay, but get people, you know, all of them to go vote in the primary, not just the few that are, you know, at the extremes. I will add to that that we actually have some great programs in, in Europe and in, within the European Union that are focused very much on knowledge sharing between cities 
and you're lucky because we have one of the, those leaders sitting right in front of me. <laughs> so there's a connection right there. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. That's a great answer. Uh, please, sir. Uh, convening the discussion. My name is Saul Salinas. I'm actually here with my wife Heather, who is class of 2007. Um, I got that right. Um, so thank you very much. I um, have actually been working the topic of climate change for, dare, dare I say it, 34 years. First with the Rural Resources Institute, then I went over to the EPA, helped launch, design, and, and uh, run the Energy Star program. And I'm now a, uh, an executive vice president with Capgemini, overseeing our climate change and sustainability practice. But even over the course of those 34 years, the last couple of years for me, I've seen some things that have actually shaken me to the core. And I wanna go back to a comment that Dr. Stevens, you made earlier to the first question about the relationship between geopolitics and climate change. Sometimes the vote doesn't matter. And going back to your comment just now, uh, I can't help but reflect on the role that authoritarian countries are having on climate change. Case in point, last year, by many accounts, the Amazon rainforest is now an net emitter of carbon, and by, by several accounts, to the tune of 4 billion metric tons of carbon a year. 4 billion metric tons of carbon a year. That's like putting 1 billion vehicles back on the road every year, which is four times the size of the U.S. fleet. That's, over, that's the, the part of the Amazon rainforest over Brazil. So my question to you, I guess, all three of you is, how do we address that? That's a geopolitical issue. That's a political decision that's being made by the current leadership of Brazil. How do we address that? It's sort of, in my opinion, the elephant in the room. And by the way, the deforestation rates over the Amazon, over the Brazilian part of the Amazon are ex accelerating at a frightening rate. So I'd, I'd like you to comment on that if you could. And I did finish that with a question mark. I didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, great question. Would you like to take on? Um, so I agree that deforestation uh, and lack of afforestation uh, is a serious contributor. Um, obviously, the Brazilian Amazon is a large part of that. To put it in context, let's recognize that uh, deforestation in the Amazon did not start with Mr. Bolsonaro. It's been going on for a, a long time, and when we to use that word that I heard earlier about arrogance, when we in the industrialized wealthy North condemn what's going on there, which is right to, to do because of the implications of it, not just for climate change, but lots else ecologically, let's keep in mind that the perspective there is that it's fine for you in the United States to tell us we shouldn't convert our forests to agricultural land you spent the entire 19th century and the early part of the 20th century doing that in your country. That agriculture is what led to your industrial base. It's a huge part of your economic development. And now you're going to tell us that we can't do that. So we have to be careful. You have to find a way in which there are incentives. And I agree with the current you know, government in Brazil. From the, I haven't worked with it, but I've worked with previous governments there. I, I anticipate it would be difficult to accomplish that now. There are mechanisms to do it. You probably know about that. In fact, is it Norway and other European yeah. countries that have been financing yeah, for many, many years now uh, afforestation and retarded deforestation projects? So in other words, part of the finance mechanisms. Thank you. I have nothing really to add no to that with no the problem. time. No problem, actually, that will allow us to, uh, mm -hmm. to have an hour question, mm -hmm. at least. Uh, please, sir. Yeah, I'm Steve Green, uh, MPP class of 82. Um, and I actually work in nuclear energy, so I need to make a couple of quick points on uh, nuclear to follow up on the nuclear discussion. Um, first of all, in addition to the discussions in Western Europe, there, uh, there's tremendous interest in nuclear power mm -hmm. in Central and Eastern Europe, in particular in Poland to mm -hmm. dipl displace coal. Uh, Romania signed an agreement to cooperate with the U.S. on advanced nuclear energy. Secondly, in the U.S., there are demonstration projects, uh, uh, two uh, funded by uh, Department of Energy, one of which uh, is in Wyoming, where there was actually competition between four towns to be the host for the project. So there actually is interest in, uh, in new nuclear power. Now I'll turn that to a question, which is, admittedly, nuclear 
advanced nuclear is a long way off, so are a number of technologies that could help in this area. How do we look, I mean, yes, 2030 and pledges and actions for 2030 are important, but how do we look to 2050? How do we anticipate that there are gonna be new technologies that are mm -hmm. gonna be required? How can we support those today so that we can have them available when we need them? because there's a lot more complication in the energy industry that for anybody that works in it than can be solved with just the few technologies we have today. So um, research on particular topics, and one of them is uh, certainly you know, something like what people like to think of as passively safe nuclear power. Um, that safe nuclear power, advanced nuclear power, uh, certain types of solar geoengineering, carbon removal. There are lots of areas where research is merited, but there are areas where, because of the economics of the situation, the structure of it, we really can't rely fully on uh, private sector to carry out the R&D, which was what we usually, at least in this country, rely upon for R&D is private industry. And there's specific reasons why we can't. And there, therefore, there is a role for government, for the energy labs and for government to be engaged in the research and development uh, on nuclear power and others. In terms of how to think about it for the long term, I'm actually just gonna recommend some reading, which you may be very familiar with. Uh, it's not from the Kennedy School, it's not from Harvard, it's from the other big university in town, uh, MIT. Uh, and it's The Future of Energy, edited by Ernie Moniz, and it's a fantastic study. Um, it, it seems like you're aware of it, and anyone interested in nuclear power should read it. Well, I will just add to, to that. I think we have to now look at all type of different technologies. And we've been uh, seeing in Europe, we've been talking a lot here about baseload. If you look at, for an example, technology that has not been uh, fully explored in the context of Europe uh, and in the world, if we extend it, is geothermal. Uh, I come from a country that every house uh, is almost heated with our volcanoes. Uh, there's not a volcanoes erupting under, under your feet in every place on the planet, uh, luckily. Uh, but we do have this untapped resource. You don't need those high temperatures to actually utilize that resource uh, for direct heating. And that's a big opportunity in Eastern Europe uh, that needs to be explored. It's not the solution, but it can play a role, be one part of the, of the big picture. And I have to tell you, because we're you know, talking about geopolitics and climate change, and, I, uh, and uh, we want to put this in the context of the solutions, right? I get so excited when I go and visit our geothermal plants and I see the innovations and technologies. I see Carbfix that is uh, turning CO2 into stone in less than two years and is now expanding operations, cleaning our aluminum uh, sector, hopefully, in the future. I see Climeworks uh, that is vacuum cleaning uh, direct air capture CO2 and, and working with companies uh, like Carbfix. And I, I become hopeful because I think the energy transition will actually you know, reveal and lead to so many innovations as well uh, that will benefit in our, uh, our communities in ways that we have no idea about uh, today. So that is what keeps me hopeful and engaged in the work. And I think we need those hopes uh, when, we, when we strive to do our best now for, for our future, for the future classes of, of HGAS. Ala, very well said. And on that note, that very hopeful note, we close the session today. I'm uh, sorry for those that were waiting, but uh, we stand between you and lunch, and that's a very hard act to, uh, to take. So uh, uh, thank you so much for participating, very active participation and engaged. Uh, Thank you to our moderator and to our panelists. Um, we'll now move, as Jorge mentioned, to the lunch break. Um, box lunches are set up downstairs in the dining cafe, so please take your desired lunch and head to the designated classroom, which is listed in Whova. It should be 